Hello everyone, this is Bonsert of Radio Retro Future and creator of the Association of Ishtar. These audio dramas took a long time to make, so please support the show by buying either the paperback or on Kindle. However, because it's Christmas season, now the Wrench in the Machines paperback is on discount, so if you're looking for an interesting gift to give you a friend, go check it out. You can also support us through places like Patreon or Subscribestar, and I'm also looking into Substack. And there will be various rewards like previews and wallpapers. And without further ado, let's get into the third chapter of The Ranch in the Machine. Enjoy! This is The Ranch in the Machine, an association of Ishtar story by Bonsert Bogle and edited by Dean Wilkins. With music by Marco Ilianello of Musical Wizardry. Chapter 3 Listen, you little shit! If I get one more complaint from Jenna, I swear, she's not my real mum. Oh, you're gonna cry now! Get out of my sight! I will deal with you when I get back! I'm not gonna lose my job over this shit! I hate you! The man's eyes widened. That phrase was reverberating through the mind of a man who had never had the opportunity to take it back. As he awoke, the man was unable to move his body or distract himself from the scar that marked his consciousness since the day his father died. Back in the present, a woman in a white dress walked by his bed. She didn't pay any attention to him. As his right arm felt inflamed and his legs were swelling, he parted his lips and attempted to move them up and down, but no sound came out. Oh. The nurse turned toward him when he managed to squeeze the words out. Mr. Alboro? She asked, almost to the point of condescension. Are you awake? He managed to nod. I'll get the doctor right away, she replied, and off she went. Laying there, the inspector tried to organize his spots. He didn't recall how he got there, just a beak-faced fellow and Bixby sitting lifeless against the locomotive. His wrist was nothing but a stump now, wrapped in bandages. The hand might be gone, but the memory was still there, likely forever. A surgeon had told him, I'm sorry Mr. Alboro, we could not save your hand. The risk of inflammation was deemed too great. That very morning, Chief Inspector Mayfair visited him to inform Alboro of what he already knew. Bixby was dead. Killed by the Priory Station Slasher. And Alboro was the only witness. No, Alboro responded with a hoarse voice. The woman of the Dollhaven was there. And another masked man who shot at her. Her? Mayfair asked. The woman of the Dollhaven? No, the stabber. The slasher is a woman, the chief responded surprised. Yeah, she has blades in her arms. She's not human. But this masked man attacked her and, and drove her off. The chief closed his eyes as he grimaced. Why did she attack you? I don't know. This must have something to do with the thing inside the Frenchman's head. The, the doll doctor took out of his brain. Mayfair nodded incredulously. Well, we did find his body at the crime scene. Unfortunately, his hat is missing. Slusher must have done so. Oh, the old doctor. The chief nodded with pursed lips. I will have a proper debrief when you're better. I'll talk with the department's physician about what we can do about the hat. Meanwhile, we have specialists in these types of cases. They'll find who did this to you. I want to be fair, Alboro mumbled as the dose of morphine started to kick in. You what? I want to... He spat out the words. Be in the investigation. The chief put his hands inside his pockets. Focus on getting better. I'll yeah, be back after a work. You're in the minds of everyone at the department. 15th of May, 1875. Baroque Police Station, Dover. A week after the incident, Alboro was welcomed back at the precinct as was to be expected. However, the usual banter Alboro was accustomed to appeared awkwardly absent. 
Bobby's getting injured was not uncommon, but when one of the lads broke an arm or nose, they were greeted with the knowledge their wounds would heal. A Bobby would respond with phrases like, You should see the other guy, or similar bravado. However, in this case, there was no glory. Nothing to brag about other than he had faced an illustrious killer and lived to tell about it. Arboro sighed when he saw Bixby's neatly arranged desk lacking any papers. In front of the chair, there was a lone picture of him with some flowers. Without saying a word, Arboro sat down at his own desk. He too was missing files, but it didn't matter. He still saw the woman looming over him as he closed his eyes, the curling of her lips into a wicked smile, those squinting eyes which gleamed with fiery determination and something else, something malicious he couldn't identify. He rubbed his face as to wipe away the memories from his imagination when a familiar voice called out his name. David! Alboro looked up at Mayfair, who was standing beside him. Despite this, his voice seemed far away from where his mind was. Mind joining me in my office? While Alboro was trying to find out how he could hold his maimed arm comfortably sitting down, Mayfair lit up his pipe. Smoke passed his lips as he nervously shook the match till the flame was extinguished. Did you enjoy the service? he asked. Alboro shifted in his chair. Even after a few days, he felt like he didn't belong anymore. Yes, it was nice. I do feel the commissioner's speech was a bit... How do you say? The chief blew out a long plume of smoke. It wasn't his first eulogy. He probably recites it in his dreams by now. Arboro nodded in contemplation. How about you, Arthur? How do you prefer your eulogy? I rather not, admitted Mayfair with a sigh. So I just forced myself to sit down and start writing. I recollect the words of my grandfather. How we deal with death is as important as how we act in life. However, it's hard to be honest when you don't want to speak ill of the dead. Alboro inhaled deeply as he stared at the stump where his hand used to be. Did you try it yet? The chief asked, responding to Alboro's posture. He put his wrist inside his pocket. Last time I tried, the wound was still sensitive. Speaking of life, he began to change the subject. Any trace of Constable Derby? Not yet. You still believe he's the one who reported what happened at the yard? Alboro shook his head. If not he, then who? The masked man? We have no evidence the constable was there. What if Derby followed the thieves? Alboro suggested. We may have to face the fact that he has deserted us. The inspector nodded admittingly. What about the investigation into Bixby's murderer? The chief put down his pipe. Like I told you, we have a specialist on it. Who? Alboro insisted. Is he from a different department? The answer was as evasive as it was apologetic. The matter is outsourced, the chief replied. Outsourced? Are we hiring private detectives now, like in the United States? It's more complicated than that. The woman you described is considered to be of special interest, as they call it. Alboro raised an eyebrow. Day? Please, David, it's beyond my position to talk about these things. Straightening himself, the inspector raised his chin. In that case, I volunteer to be a witness. David. No, I'm the one who was there. How can I not be part of this investigation? Mayfair crossed his arms. It's out of my hands. It's what? Well, if this private eye isn't interested in what I have to say, maybe the tabloids will. The chief's eyes grew wider. David, that's outrageous! This is outrageous! Alboro bellowed red-faced. Three, no, five people are dead because of her. The chief looked past him with a concerned look on his face. When Alboro turned around, he saw a dozen or so stunned faces looking at them through the office window. Enraged, the inspector opened the door and walked up to the balustrade. What's this? He snapped from atop the stairs. Are you looking at a Punch and Judy show? Get back to work! The glass trembled as he slammed the door behind him and turned to the chief. Write me down as a witness, Arthur! The chief stared at him with hands inside his pockets. You understand I have to make note of your behavior. You do what you have to do, Alboro said as he put on his hat. 
I'll do mine. There was an unexpected knock on the window. It was Buckton, who came in with a rather boyish grin on his face. What's going on, constable? asked the chief. Grinning, Buckton pointed across his own shoulder. There's a lady down there to see you, sir. He leaned in closer and whispered, It's Clara Lentry, sir. It rang a bell in Alborough's mind, but he could not place the name. Wait, are you talking about the actress? Surely not, Mayfair responded. Surely, yes, sir, he said with a wink. Legs and all. You can't fake those. Alborough frowned an eyebrow. Her legs. Yes, sir. Those are peg legs, he said gleefully, but it's impossible to tell. The officers looked at each other. Why would an actress come all this way to Dover? The constable's face retracted. You're making it sound like there's something wrong with Dover, sir. Oh, of course not. They got distracted by a disruption on the first floor. A lady, dressed in clothes far more flamboyant than is typical of Dover, barged in. The thick braids, laced with glittering netting at the back of her head, seemed heavy enough to break her neck. Yet, she forced her way past the officers, elegantly and unencumbered. His colleagues seemed frustrated with the stranger at first, however, they forgot the indiscretion the moment they recognized her. It was hard to believe, but renowned stage and voice actress Clara Lantry walked the station floor as, or so Alborough imagined, only an actress could. The man's faces lit up when a lady asked him something and directed her to Mayfair's desk. With an elegant but determined strut, she marched up the stairs toward the office. Without knocking, she flung the door open with a theatrical swing of her arms and tilted her head as he asked with a deliberate and sensuous voice. I'm looking for Chief Inspector Mayfair. Her voice was sultry, sibilant and clear. It seemed unreal, just like on the speaky. Mayfair stood up straight and straightened his vest. That would be me, he said, flustered like a schoolboy. She walked up to him, closer than was decent, and offered her hand to kiss it. I am Clara Landry. Pleased to make your acquaintance, Chief Inspector. Mayfair politely held her hand, but refrained from kissing it, probably dissuaded by Alborough's disproving glare. Without asking, she set herself down in a chair. I'm here on behalf of the followers of the signal. Ah, Mayfair responded, grinning like he had a toothache. Yes, when do you intend to release the bodies of our brothers? Your brothers? Well, the commissioner promised to return them today. They must be conveyed before the day's end. Please don't tell me they were taken too. Alborough couldn't take it anymore and interrupted them. <clears throat> um, excuse me. Conveyed? Yes, to ensure their minds are intact for future ascension. Mayfair stammered. W well, Alborough again butted in. We need those for the investigation. She so turned to him, smiling. Excuse me, but who are you? Inspector Alborough. I was the last man to see your brothers alive. He held his bandaged wrist just where she could see it. It seemed to put her on the defensive. Did you? I heard rumors about a survivor. That was you, I take it. That's correct. Unfortunately, the force lost a good man that day. Her cheeks creased uncomfortably while she maintained her smile. So did we. Mayfair raised a finger. To get back to the point, as my colleague explained, we just can't release their bodies without their family's consent at this time. If their own testaments don't suffice, officer, we can return their bodies afterwards. Afterwards? Alboro wondered out loud. You're not going to bury them. The actress sighed. We just need their minds, she said impatiently. He raised an eyebrow. You mean you want to save their brains? Alboro had heard rumors about the signalites before, but he just thought they were exaggerated. She turned her eyes away, aghast. It will suffice, she conceded. I assure you, our surgeons are very careful during the proceedings. I'll have a word with the commissioner, the chief said. And with that you mean, consider it done, don't you, Mr. Mayfair? Well, I... She clutched her hands together as if aesthetic. Oh, thank you so much, Chief Inspector. 
I... I'm a busy woman, Mr. Mayfair. Please, I need to sign paperwork. Could you arrange it as quickly as possible? Alboro, having enough of this charade, reached for his hat, at which the chief responded, Just a moment, miss. David, where are you going? Don't worry, he replied while opening the door. Just going to the bakery. Frustrated, Alboro walked down the stairs. He noticed his colleagues, the males in particular, keeping a close eye on the chief's door, hoping to catch another glimpse of the actress. Outside, as the inspector walked off the station steps, he noticed a pristine white electric car whose dashing appearance was in steep contrast to the drab appearance of the Dover Street. An art piece on wheels whose white glossy paint reflected the sun in a mirror image. The lady sure knows how to attract attention. Alvaro thought disapprovingly while inspecting the abstract symbols on the site that reminded him of some technical schematic. Meanwhile, the driver, dressed in a well-fitted light grey uniform, leaned against the back of the vehicle while smoking a cigarette. Curiously, his legs were braced down from the ankles up to and including the knees with a silvery carapace similar to the leg protectors of ancient Greek armor. The inspector had seen such contraptions before, but these were by no means ordinary medical braces. They were too sleek, made from materials he couldn't directly identify. Bixby undoubtedly might have known. The driver noticed Alvaro eyeing him, and when their eyes met, the inspector recognized him immediately. The driver's mouth fell open, and after a brief pause, he disdainfully threw his cigarette into the gutter. The braces joints moved fluently as the man approached the inspector. Now Alvaro knew it was him. His hair was shaven now, but he still had that disdainful glare around his eyes. Well, look at that! The driver began as he approached. Constable David Alvaro, he said mockingly. Fancy meeting you here. So they let you out, MacArthur. I expected you to be in the dock for at least what? Another decade? Well, my case got reviewed and my sentence was suspended due to a... He tapped his leg braces with the sides of his shining boots. The circumstances around my arrest. Alboro inhaled deeply through his nose, refraining from taking the bait. Is that so? And now you just happen to work for a celebrity. Does he know? Actually, Miss Landry is quite a champion of the victims of the system. Alboro rolled his eyes. You still dare to call yourself a victim of the system? How do you see yourself? Where's your uniform, constable? Oh, that shattering my kneecaps got you a nice promotion. His heart was pounding as the blood rushed through his head. Listen, you. Is there a problem? Asked a sultry woman's voice. As they turned to Miss Lentry, MacArthur's demeanor changed immediately. Oh, no problem at all, miss. Just speaking with an old friend, he said, smiling, and rushed for the car door. The disdainful glare had disappeared, entirely leaving a loyal, yet friendly gaze that could fool anyone. Her eyes lit up. Oh, Mr. Alboro, was it? Inspector Alboro, he said, smirking. I see. Well, for what it's worth, I hope you find the assassin, Inspector. With that said, Mac Arthur opened the carriage door and let the actress in. Alboro peeked at her feet, but all he could see was a glossy ankle-high stiletto. If she had lacked prosthesis, it was indeed impossible to tell. Oh, come now, Inspector! Mac Arthur remarked loudly enough for the other people to hear. What knows better than to look at the lady's ankles? Alboro peered at him from underneath his thick eyebrows as he noticed a curious stare of onlookers. With that swarmy smile of his, MacArthur turned around and entered the car. Alboro had turned his back to them as they drove off and pondered. If Miss Lantry had a man like MacArthur working for her, what does that say about the actress? Was it a coincidence that, of all the men he arrested during his career, she had brought him? Or maybe he was just overthinking it. As he made his way inside the vehicle depot of the police station, the drained inspector looked for an available bicycle. But once he did and grabbed one of the handles, he stopped. How to get on this thing without his second hand? 
He tried swinging his leg over the frame, but he was too stiff. He couldn't hold up the bicycle straight. To make matters worse, two constables were watching his dilemma. Uh, need help, Inspector? One of them asked carefully. He sighed. No, I have an aid. Ten minutes later, Alboro was finally cycling through Dover streets. Though he still struggled with finding a proper angle on how to control the stair with the hook on his wrist. The prosthesis was strapped to his lower arm and shoulder, and irritated the scar tissue too, but it was manageable. It was a painful reminder that the simplest thing seemed a struggle now. This morning, he grabbed a pot of chutney from the kitchen shelf, realizing he had no way to unscrew the lid, or properly prepare his breakfast, or tie his shoes, or button his cufflinks, and so on. Dressed like a slob, he arrived at Bixby's funeral service, and tried to stay out of sight. All of this was his fault. If only he filled the bloody forms himself. Or maybe had been more aggressive when he first met Borhave. Or... Alboro tried to make the self-flagellating thought slip and squeeze the brakes. One last stop at the bakery, he thought, inspecting the store shelves with fresh bread, scones and delicious buns. He nodded approvingly. This should do it. The afternoon was getting warmer. A powerful breeze swept up the dust from the cobblestone road as the inspector drove between the buildings of the old industrial area. In front of the Howard and Chambers building, he stopped. Groaning, Alboro struggled to keep his balance as he got off the vehicle. At this point, Alboro developed a love-hate relationship with the bike, but at least he got a hang of driving it with his disability. As he straightened his jacket, out of a nearby alley a lone dog emerged. An old mutt with some terrier in him and fur as rough as a doormat. It held one of his hind legs up as it limped up to him, growling at the bag hanging from the inspector's side. Alboro pressed the bag demonstrably against his chest. It's not for you. Now shoo. The mutt tilted its head, yammering pathetically. Ignoring the animal, he approached the door that was boarded up by the police, but Alboro came prepared with a crowbar and used it to remove some of the boards as gently as possible. Meanwhile, the dog was watching him critically. You're not getting anything. Get lost, the inspector warned while dislodging another board. Finally, he made enough room to squeeze his body through, if only he was younger. Dusting himself off, he rose to his feet and looked around. The dog followed him inside and sat belligerently beside him, as if to say, Are you sure you're not missing anything? Nothing seems to be different, he mumbled. Then he walked up to the middle of the space and raised his voice. I know you are here. I brought you some sweet almond buns. They are all yours. All you need to do is answer some questions. When he held up the bag to open it, he realized he had no hand to do so. Instead, he used his hook as a coat hanger from which he suspended the bag and took out a pastry. He then took a bit bite. Mmm, I haven't eaten these in years. Good bakers are hard to find these days. The dog growled and squeaked greedily as he tap danced from left to right. Alboro gave the mongrel a disappointed look. Well, if she's not here, I suppose they're all yours. I can't finish this many. He admitted as the dog impatiently held his nose up. Oh, fine! He heard a girl call out. The two turned their gaze upward as a ginger-haired girl stuck her freckled head out from behind some crates that were covered up in burlap. Alboro looked in amazement, intrigued by her differently colored eyes. A natural emerald on the right and a not-so-normal crystal blue on the other with a slight translucent look to it. She approached him with slanted shoulders and a rather apathetic expression on her face. Not surprising for a teenager, but she wore a pastel green robe as if she belonged to some neo-druidic order of some kind, complete with collapsible hood that covered her shoulders. It wasn't some historical reproduction, instead all the layers had a triangular shape that overlapped each other like scales. Whatever she was, she was no ordinary urchin. With a rebellious glare in her eyes, she looked up at him. What do you want to know? She asked with a peculiar francophone accent. He smiled. 
Why don't you sit down and eat something first, he said while offering her a cinnamon bun. After taking the pastry, she sat on the barrel opposite to him and greedily bit into the bun, mauling excessively. You like it? She nodded, be it reluctantly. Meanwhile, the dog looked at her with hungry eyes. She tore off a piece of the pastry and threw it halfway across the room. The dog gave chase as his meal flew overhead and nearly tumbled as he ran past its goal. But within moments he devoured it, dust and all. You're just encouraging him, you know. Alboro remarked as the dog returned to his starting position. You're doing the same with me? She remarked, shrugging her shoulders and taking another bite. He ignored her observation and asked, What's your name? None of your business. She answered with her mouth full. All right, miss, none of your business. Do you know who owns this place? It's just so in the front. She responded as if it should be obvious. What a brat, he thought. All right, who are Howard and Chambers? She didn't respond. The inspector sighed, reaching in his bag and took out some candy. You like raspberry taffy? You want to bribe me with candy? She responded, insulted. I am not a child, you know. He raised an eyebrow in disbelief. I'm sixteen, she said, raising her voice. He looked her up and down. She was no taller than a fourteen-year-old. Arms crossed, he added. I'm small for my age, okay? The inspector held up a bag with candy with a questioning look on his face. In return, she glared. All right, fine, she said as he reached out her arm. He handed her the bag and asked, So, who are H and C? She shrugged her shoulders. I don't know. I just sleep here. Fine then. Miss Boerhaver, the lady at Hendrix Dollhaven, is involved in the case that got a fellow inspector killed this week. He said sternly. Now, I'm about to go to her and arrest her if I don't get a proper reason not to. She scowled when hearing the remark. Dr. Jennifer does not kill people. Doctor? He repeated. So you do know each other. She looked down at her bun and threw it away, to the dog's delight who ran after it. Sometimes she takes care of me. B but you can't tell her I'm here, she insisted. Are you hiding from her? It's not like that, she protested and bowed her head. I just wanted to be left alone. I'll return home next week. Not wanting to get involved in the girl's personal life, he considered the situation. But Alborough didn't like the idea of leaving her with a person who cuts up corpses. My friend, Alborough began. His name was Tom Bixby. He was murdered by a monstrous woman who appeared to be half machine. Before she attacked, there were numbers recited on a nearby wireless. Does that mean anything to you? She hesitated for a moment, but the description didn't seem to surprise her. She sounded like she could be an outsider. As for the numbers... Did you say outsider? Alboro interrupted her. Sure, you know of them, right? Creatures and people that come through rifts? Well, he thought about it for a moment. He heard of these anomalies called rifts. These appeared all over the world and there were many rumors about them. But the average person cared as much about rifts as they would worry about dormant volcanoes. They knew the risks and dangers. But he's also made good tourist attractions. An accident that occurred during the Franco-Prussian War caused a rift to rupture, if he recalled correctly. This made creatures from another world run rampant. But the threat was contained by the Imperial Army. And then some actor died, what was his name again, Rutger Hauer or something? And people just forgot about it. All right, Alboro pondered out loud. What is an outsider doing here? Shrugging, the girl answered, I know there is a rift near the harbor. Her eyes started to light up. I can show you. His eyebrows rose. You can? It was about more than the investigation now. He had never seen a rift before. Tonight she said. But I want a week's worth of food in return. Alboro tilted his head. That was it? He crossed his arms. Well, hmm, very well. It, but it better be worth it, he said, playing up his skepticism. Fine, she slid off the crate. 
Meet me in the large park near the glass house. I? Pendleton Park? If that's what it's called, she replied to Luke. He nodded. Fine then. I'll see you tonight. Twilight had come to Pendleton Park. One of Dover's cultural highlights, designed and paid for by the man to which the park owed its namesake. It read one of the biggest greenhouses, outside of London, at its center. The complex consisted of four wonderful glass domes arranged in a clover pattern with a copula on top of the main dome. The beams were curved in elegant angles and overgrown with ivy and other evergreens. The top of the central tower looked similar to that of a lighthouse which contained a small observatory. Truly a wonderful public work. But in these austere times maintenance isn't what it had been. And algae was growing on the glass. Alvaro walked slowly across the slate pavement. The bag dangled by his hook at the side. The pastries inside were cold at this point, but the scent had a reinvigorated his appetite. As a faint distraction, he looked up at the darkening sky as the waning moon revealed itself, and the bell-shaped Elysium in its shadow. Elysium. The legend goes that Sir Pendleton had an odd obsession with that mysterious object that followed the orbit of the moon since the 1790s. The heavenly body looked like a blue shining beacon. Was it a relic, a crashed alien ship or a city? It was an ancient riddle, that was for sure. Despite its disappearance millennia ago, and knowledge on the object was obscured in myth, it inspired religions, philosophy, and even space travel. All attempts to reach it, however, ended in catastrophic failure. A curse on its creator, who used the same rocket technology to bombard the English coast during the times of the Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte I. Alboro stood at the edge of the crater left by one of these so-called vengeance rockets. Pendleton left the hole intentionally. It was said a chapel once stood here in which people sought shelter when a wave of three of such monstrosities came at Dover. Alboro wasn't even born yet. But his father told him of the horrible wailing sound its engines made as they crossed the channel. It was also the task of the Dover police to fight the fires. Seven rockets in total would hit the city during those years. The people in the chapel were lucky in that regard. Afterwards, many joked that even in the house of the Lord nobody was safe from man's ingenuity. Yet, others proclaimed it was a miracle that the rocket had not exploded. Now, the remains of that very missile stood from the crater as a macabre reminder of what happened all those years ago. Alboro looked over his shoulder. Two haggard men passed by, clearly intoxicated. An increasingly common sight. It was not a place for a child at this hour. The park was losing its splendor. If it wasn't for local volunteers, it might have degraded to nothing, except for trees surrounded by undergrowth. Enthusiastic barking in the distance broke the silence. When Alboro walked toward the source of the noise, he found a strange girl sitting on a swing, accompanied by the mutt. She had her hood pulled over her head this time. The swing's chains creaked as he played fetch with the dog, who returned with a bigger stick every time. Hello, miss, none of your business, he began. I see you made a loyal friend. She shrugged her shoulders. Proudly, Alboro held up the sack. I got your reward, he teased. When she reached out, he kept the bag just out of her reach. Point me at the rift first, missy. She pouted and stuck out her left hand. Alboro squinted his eyes for a moment. Was he seeing that right? The girl appeared to have a device in the palm of her hand, a tattooed emblem of some kind. The two triangles reflected the lamplight as she directed those tattoos right at him. Suddenly, Alboro felt a tug at the bag, and before he could comprehend what was happening, it was pulled from his grasp. It was as if a ghost dragged the sack through the air and delivered it straight into the girl's hand. Even the dog looked surprised as he held up the bag of pastries with an impish smile on her face. Frozen stiff, he looked at her. Did you do that? Alboro asked, perplexed. How did you do that? She pulled out a loaf from the sack and put it straight into her mouth. 
is a secret? Now it was his turn to frown. Fine then. Where are we going? She slid off the swing. Follow me, she said and walked off. As they strolled in the direction of the greenhouse, in the warm light of the lanterns, Alboro spotted a cluster of bumps on her head. What's with the bruises? he asked. Embarrassed, the girl pulled her hood down. I bumped my head. Multiple times, he wondered, but he decided not to comment. They stopped next to a separate wing of the glass house, a side building in the same style, but the panes were made of frosted glass. A sign near the door read, No entry, property of utter crap. Because of course it was. Is this a storage area of sorts? You'll see, the girl said as he reached underneath her hood and pulled out a hairpin. To the inspector's dismay, she then stuck it inside the lock of the door and started to pick it. What are you doing? She remained undeterred. You wanted to see the rift, right? She replied as he unlocked the door with relative ease. Staring at the door opening with his mouth agape, he asked, Is this something you do often? I can do a lot of things, she said proudly and wiped away the sweat of her forehead. Are you alright? Sure, it's just... Humid. Let's go inside. They entered the restricted area. Alboro looked around, but there was nothing here, except for a large black and white checkered block about 20 feet in all directions. Is this supposed to be art? More like a puzzle, but I can imagine people not knowing the difference. A bit cynical at your age, aren't you, young lady? Now that he thought about it, he still didn't know her name. Maybe I'm just smarter than most people my age. She bragged while holding the emblem against the checkered panels. What are you doing? There was an audible turning of gears coming from behind the plates. Then, one of the checkered panels was lodged free. Albo nervously stroked his fingers through his hair as the panel floated out of its slot, revealing a safe lock secured by a numerical dial. How did you do that? Smug. She knelt in front of the dial and lay her hand on the panel. Apart from not contributing anything, the inspector grew concerned he was dealing with an actual witch. What are you doing now? I can see the mechanisms inside it. Because it is so smooth, I can easily move the gears behind the panel that way. Guess they didn't count on a wizard, eh? Oh dear. Alboro mumbled, stroking his clammy head and feeling very uncomfortable because he teased her before. Meanwhile, she stared intensely at the panel until there was a clicking noise coming from behind the cast steel and she turned the handle. There was a slight thump and a large hatch revealed itself. Amazing, he thought out loud. You are a wizard, you say? Are you actually using magic? Her smile disappeared suddenly. Of course not. Well, I'm sorry, it's all new to me. Alboro mumbled, shocked by her overreaction. Then again, he did feel a tad silly for raising the question. Right, never mind. Let me open the hatch, she said, and unlocked the mechanism. Dust drifted across the floor as one of the cube sides tilted upward. Curiously, Alboro bent over so he could peek inside the large vault. He could not believe Utter Crab went through all this trouble. There was nothing, apart from a strange dark powder on the floor that scattered like fine ash as he trod inside. Behind him, the dog moaned nervously and paced back and forth as if he was walking beside a river. The girl sighed, disappointed. Fine then, she said to the dog. You wait here. The dog lay down with its snout between its paws and observed them anxiously. Alboro swiped his finger over the floor and inspected the dust. What is this grey stuff? She knelt and grabbed a handful of the powder. Nothing can stay away from their plane of origin for long, she explained, and left the powder pour down from her hand. So, floating leaves, animals, and non-living matter. Whatever comes through a reef turns to powder in a month or so, unless it returns, that is. Humans too. Humans are animals. Right. Where is the rift then? Look closer, was all she said, staring at the wall. He scanned the cube. It felt like a tomb that had been uncovered in the desert, a black desert. 
but he noticed a faint rimple in the air like a vertical mirage hovering just above the ground, like smoke rising from the end of a cigar. The longer he observed it, the larger it seemed to become. Moving closer still, the mirage seemed to widen, and colors around it started to fade into a grayish haze. Don't come too close just yet, she warned, standing behind him. Reefs don't respond the same way to everyone. Awestruck, he stared at the hazy rimples. So it's all true then, he said, staring. Inside that, th there's another world. Want to see it? He looked at her. She had a childish twinkle in her eyes. Don't worry, it's safe, she reassured him. I've been there before. He turned back to the rift. In his imagination, he could hear the train whistle blowing. Was it time to get off, or... Let's get on, he answered. Hmm? He straightened his jacket. Let's get on with it, I said. How does it work? Just walk through it, she answered plainly. All right, let's go. Ladies first. She grinned and stepped forward, shaking her head. Without hesitation, she walked into the mirage and faded away like a ghost inside the darkness. Just like that, she was gone, leaving nothing but an odd rimple in the fabric of reality itself. He swallowed while his feet felt stuck to the ground. But not to be outdone, he cleared his throat and loosened his shoulders. The dark's concerned yammering broke his flow, however. Oh, don't you start! He warned and looked at the challenge in front of him. All aboard! He cried and strolled straight at the rift. He could feel it now. A strange chill enveloped him and then... Nothing. You have been listening to The Wrench in the Machine, an association of Ishtar story by Bonsert Bokel. We hope you enjoyed this presentation.